Hello and welcome to the latest Science of Sport podcast. I'm your host, Matt Solomon, and today I'm delighted to be joined by John Bell. So John is a lecturer at Leeds Beckett University, and he also works in a medical and research capacity with British Wrestling, GB Muay Thai, and Bare Knuckle Boxing Associations. He has a strong personal interest in mobility and flexibility, and that's what we're here today to discuss. So without further ado, it's time to welcome John onto the show. Welcome to the Science of Sport podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. So can you give us a quick introduction as to who you are and what you've been up to until now? Yep. Um, so I'll, I'll start, uh, how far should we go back? I'll start uh, post school. So um, I left school. I didn't go a lot. Joined the military. Um, did a lot of medical work within the military. Um, saved a bit of money from, from, from Afghanistan. Um, and what I did, why I would say that is relevant is uh, I slowly did my qualifications, so I went level one, level two, level three, and worked my way up, um, which I, I believe in that mini course that I've done um, gives me a slightly broader insight of kind of pitching it at different levels. Um, that is mobility and flexibility. Um, then I went to university. Um, since my undergrads and my postgrads, um, I have worked in professional football, professional rugby league, not union. Um, I've worked with Olympic athletes, UFC athletes. I'm currently with um, the GB wrestling team, so the British Wrestling Association. Um, I lecture full time at Leeds Beckett University. That's my third higher education establishment. I um, my research um, is predominantly well, more my, my published research is predominantly grappling and wrestling. That I've just got a grant for something that I think is really cool. And it's um, accelerometer based mouth guards. Um, and we're going to put it in bare knuckle boxes and glove boxes. And we're going to measure uh, linear and angular head acceleration to, to see how it compares. I do a lot of medical work for uh, the British um, fighting championship, the one that Conor McGregor's just bought. That's probably how people know that. Um, and I've also just been approached by uh, the GB be Muay Thai Association to do some research into um, the safety protocols for when uh, adolescent athletes are going into um, adult competition because they have, they have rules on, on head contact and so forth. Uh, so that's, I would say, for relatively okay overview would you say matt <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely i think there's yeah. loads of stuff in there if you look if you put that on an a4 cv then like you're just listing it all off so uh, there's loads and loads of different experience there and you mentioned mobility and flexibility right so you've done um, a mini course on that and hopefully we can link that later in the, in the show notes but before we get into how to to train those different physical aspects and go through all of the different um possibilities there what's the difference between mobility and flexibility Okay, so this is something that I'm guilty of just using them interchangeably. Um, but if you were to go for a textbook, flexibility is um, the range that a joint can do passively, so no contraction involved. So you would see this quite a lot in, in yoga, or simply if you put your, your leg up onto the chair or the sofa to, to cause a stretch, it's predominantly gravity there that, that is holding the leg in place and, and the uh, external um, object where mobility involves the contraction. So it's your available range in a joint that you can move yourself by contracting your arm. So again, if I'm moving my arm around in circumduction, I've done that by contraction. So um, it's very much one is a passive movement and one is an active movement. And sometimes I, use the words like active mobility and passive mobility but if i was being 100 percent correct it should be flexibility and, and mobility and what, why are those things unimportant because so it sounds obvious right like you're gonna um, move your arm or your leg or your hip or your neck or whatever through a different range of movement in sport to to hopefully win or produce force so why why do we need those characteristics well i think it's quite surprising when you look at the research because um, I was always led to believe that mobility was crucial in injury prevention, where if you look at the research, it's actually really mixed to the point that you couldn't really say with any confidence that increasing mobility does decrease injury risk or injury rates. 
what there is plenty of research to show is that um, it can improve sports performance. So there was a, a systematic review that came out early this year. It was by, um, I'm going to butcher this person's name, it's by uh, Sokpak, Sokpal, something like that. Um, I'm sure there'll be a reference list somewhere that you can, you can find it on. It's on the mini course, actually. You can look at the reference list in the mini course. And he reviewed um, 22 different studies um, after some form of mobility intervention and 20 of those 22 studies showed improvements in jump ability, balance, proprioception, uh, sport specific skills, uh, strength, and also speed related tasks. So it's been, it's not just that systematic review that there's lots of research out there, but obviously with that being the most um, current review, it's, it's quite clear that mobility has a positive effect on, on, on sports performance. And when, when we want to have that positive effect, how do we, how can we go about improving mobility and flexibility? Cause I think you mentioned things like yoga earlier. It's kind of, there's that kind of obvious, well, if you stretch, you'll be flexible. Like right? that's, I think intuitively yeah. loads of people get that right. But what are the options that we have available when it comes to improving both mobility and flexibility? Yeah. So uh, this is probably what well, I think is probably the broadest question. Um, to which I'll, I'll try not to make it too broad and I'll, I'll try not to digress. I mean, in the simplest format, stretching is quite easy because if someone said to you, is this stretch working? And you said, do you feel a stretch? And they said, yes, you'd be like, yeah, it's working then. But there's lots of, there's lots of different methods. Um, so you've got your static stretching, your dynamic, uh, dynamic stretching, uh, your proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, uh, your METs, which is kind of a very similar in how, how that works to PNF. And then you've got your, um, your resistance training. So your weight based training going through, um, predominantly isotonic movements, uh, in, in full range. Um, and they even, there's this research out there. There's a really good paper. It's a little bit dated now. It's from about 10 years ago by, um, Paige. And again, it's just a big review of, of all the different mobility techniques. And it pretty much concludes that everything, everything works. It's more about, <laughs> it's more about what's best for you because there's been research out there that's shown that different populations, um, they, uh, have better effects from, from different modalities and it's also going to differ from your athletes training volume, their intensity, what concurrent training they're doing. So I think I've copped out about this because everyone's probably wanting to tell me the best stretch, tell me, tell me what to do, but you need to do some form of movement screening, some sort, some sort of monitoring for you to then try these techniques and see if they're working. If you're in the gym four times, five times a week already doing weight training, then you might get enough full ROM training that you don't need to put any additional mobility training. Um, if someone was injured and they were coming back from an injury, cause my background is sports medicine predominantly, um, you would structure it differently. And again, it's where you're going to put it in a plan. So you're not going to put static stretching before your workout in a warm up because it's been shown to um, promote the parasympathetic system where you obviously want the sympathetic system before going into any type of training um, or competitive environment. So you would put your static training, uh, training after um, and you would use the dynamic training beforehand. Um, so to, to not ramble too much, there's many techniques and they all work. So it would be a little bit of trial and error and see what works for you. But I think what is the better thing to know is how to structure the different types of mobility training to your current training program. And a, li a little bit like you would you do with any that? modality. How, how, how would you then go about doing that? Cause you mentioned uh, obviously, um, the, uh, dynamic before static after, is there any other little bits and pieces there you think are important? Um, so. Again, if, if mobility was of massive importance to your sport, cause like I said, there's no evidence to show, oh, well, sorry, there's no consistent evidence to show that mobility training, um, will lower injuries, but it has been shown to help regain ROM after injury. If I was doing some form of injury rehabilitation program, I look at what stage we're in. So, um, 
proliferation stage, remodeling stage. And that's when I would maybe do my PNF. PNF is predominantly something you can do it yourself, but a practitioner, so a strength condition coach, a physiotherapist, whatever, it involves doing some passive stretching and then some contraction from the end range, what I would call the bind. So in terms of risk to the participant, it's a lot lower than them maybe loading them up because the evidence on resistance training and increased mobility suggests that you need to actually um, axial bear, you need to work, you, you can't just do body weight exercises like a squat or a lunge, it needs to actually be loaded. Um, and obviously, depending on what you're doing in your training program, and if you are injured or if you're elderly, or maybe if you're an adolescent, you don't necessarily want to be loading all of your exercise to get that mobility. And therefore, I would put a lot of PNF in. And I would run it a lot like a yoga class. It wouldn't be, I wouldn't do all the different sequences and, and the breathing in between or, or the balances as such. But you, again, you'd maybe do a lower body session. You start at the feet for the Achilles and you'd work your, your way up. Try to make it flow. Try to have a laugh with the team or with your client. It can be a little bit boring. So again, try, trying to make it as entertaining as you possibly can. Um, and again, I guess... I guess I'd best be able to explain it um, by doing a case study, but we'll, we'll probably move towards that in the end. And I'll, I'll kind of give you an example and, and what I would do when presented with a certain problem. It's a little bit like an injury. Till you figure out what that injury is by a proper assessment, everything else is just kind of guesswork and you're just presuming. But as soon as you figure out what it is, that's when you can be like, right, this is what I'm going to do now. But before we get onto a case study, I want to get into some physiology as well. So. Obviously, you want to improve flexibility and mobility. Um, there are different options. We've gone through that. Um, but what happens when you, you increase either flexibility or mobility? What, what, is, it, is it muscles being able to stretch more? Is it um, tendons, ligaments? Is it, what, what, what's going on there? Uh, so this is something I really like. Um, a lot of my work in postgrad are in, in biomechanics, specifically impact biomechanics, and it follows a similar model. To an extent, because it, it's you're, you're you're causing some form of deformity to a tissue, like you would with an injury, but only we're doing this deliberately. And I really just I, I I really enjoy talking about this, so you probably have to stop me. Um, and there's a little bit of in the mini course as well, to which I, I catch myself on. So basically, you can split it down into um, some different cycles or some relationships. So you have your stress strain cycle. Um, again, if you were to Google that, it will come straight up and it pretty much splits, um, obviously, the, the length of a tissue, how much you're going you're gonna to stress it, to the regions that you can go to before causing um, a lasting change. So you have a toe region and that would be just taking a muscle back to its normal relaxed, um, sorry, not to its relaxed, um, to its, its resting length is what I meant to say there. Um, and then we have our elastic and we have our plastic regions and then we have our failure regions. If we go so far along, we will cause a deformity to that tissue, so micro tears, which is what we're trying to do. And therefore, we've created a, a lasting change to that muscle. So we've, we've created some passive mobility. And there's other things you, you can look at that model for kind of the stress relaxation effect. You can look at it for um, dynamic stretching where we look at things like hysteresis and how you can by suddenly spiking up on that cycle um, and suddenly um, lowering yourself in that cycle from a fast movement like a dynamic movement rather than a slow static stretch. You lose less energy with a muscle, so therefore it's better for continuing force production. I promise the mini course explains it better. Um, but you also have the length tension cycle. Uh, again, this is going to be a very vague uh, overview of it. You have your um, silent filament theory, and then you have your mycin and your actin. Your actin goes over your mycin heads, and you've got a contraction. The length um, tension relationship shows you at what would be the ideal point would you want the length of that muscle for a an optimal contraction, uh, so for force production. So if we were to, if our goal was to um, uh, sacromere genesis, which would be to create 
more sarcomeres parallel to each other, so therefore we're increasing the amount of force production a muscle could do, we want every single mice in the head to be um, contactable from the, um, from the actin. If you have too much passive mobility, they're going to be too far apart. They're going to have your V-diff over here. You're going to have your Titan. And when they go to pass over the heads, so think of a rectangle and a rectangle on the outside. The rectangle on the outside can't reach all the heads. Therefore, you're going to lower the contraction. And that's what happens if you have too much passive mobility or flexibility. If you go to the other side and you're too stiff, basically the actin crosses each other, crosses over each other, my apologies, before it can even start to shorten to try and touch the mice and heads. Therefore, the actin blocks itself and you're not going to get the strongest contraction possible. So it kind of shows you how being too stiff is going to have a, a negative output on performance or force production and how being too passive, having too much um, flexibility will be the correct term, will also hinder it. And I, I think learn if you really want to go to the next level and understand it, they're the two things you will look at. Again, and finally, I won't talk about this too much for, for time. You've also got, when we're looking at um, PNF, we have uh, how the mechanoreceptors work, like our muscle spindles, um, how our uh, corticospinal tract works with involuntary um, contraction and how that plays a part in facilitation and um, inhibition of uh, motor neurons. Again, the mini course has one video on it. So if you find that really interesting, that one video out of the six, you'll absolutely love it. If you found that incredibly boring, then you skip that one video and just listen to the other five. <laughs> and it is, it's, it's not as heavy on the physiology. And I'm really interrupting to make sure you're up to date and aware of the Science of Sport Coach Academy. The Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses, which are broken down into bite-sized chunks. So if you're enjoying today's podcast and you want to get your hands on some more great sports science information, all you have to do is hit the link in the show notes. You can get in there completely for free for the next seven days. So when the podcast is finished, hit that link in just a few minutes time. Excellent. So <clears throat> when it, when it comes down to, um, like let's say you you want you want to train these aspects. Are there any yeah. misconceptions around flexibility and, and mobility training? Because, I mean, I can I can think of some stuff now that I'm like, oh well, is is that really true? So, for example, lifting heavy weights will will make you less less flexible. Um, mm -hmm. Stretching after a really heavy session. You mentioned micro tests, for example. If you've already caused those tests, do you want to stretch more and potentially make more of those uh, those tests? Is, do, do, are those things? things that people should be considering, or is it kind of a little bit like, actually, it's not really a big deal? Well, by pure chance and not by me planning it out, I can link it back a tiny bit to what I've just said. So I would say that with that um, stereotype that weightlifting will make you stiff, I think people are kind of referring to the point on the um, length tension cycle where you become so stiff that it's actually affecting force production. And that is very, very, very rarely the case when it comes to weightlifting. In fact, the research that we do have, which is quite a lot, again, we've got some recent um, systematic reviews, um, and two actually, two pretty recent systematic reviews, one from 2003 and one from 2001 by Alonso et al. That shows that um, weight training, predominantly full, full, full long weight training with, um, again, the use of a weight, so an external load, actually can increase joint mobility just as much as any of the training method. So again, if you're short of time and you can only get in for weight training sessions, then make sure you plan some exercises that go through full ROM and you should see many benefits in mobility as well. And I think that's probably the biggest misconception, um, like you mentioned, um, stretching afterwards, I, again, it's how it's if you go, if you go back to the stress drain cycle, to what extent are you stretching to? I would say stretching after exercise is to try and return the muscle to the length that it was before exercising. And the main reason I would use um, like static passive stretching is because again you're trying to lower someone out of a sympathetic state, high adrenaline state of competing or, or training, and you're trying to lower that down because as we know from again research, being in a a 
a sympathetic high adrenaline state for a long period of time increases the chances of, of overtraining or at least speeds it up. So the goal there for me is just simply calm the athlete down, calm the nerves down and return the muscles to the to their resting length, so kind of to the toe region um, on the stress strain cycle rather than trying to cause micro tears by uh, pushing beyond a certain buying point. Absolutely excellent. And obviously we, we wanted to finish off with a case study as well. And you, you alluded to it earlier that you can you can talk us through some stuff in some more detail. So when you're going to go through a, a flexibility and mobility session, what, what does that look like? So someone comes in the door, what are you doing? Okay, so I, I what I did, I, I delayed answering your question by a few more questions, didn't I? And I set myself up for this to be a really good answer. So I've already put, <laughs> I've, already put I've already put, I've, de I've delayed it to put more pressure on here. So, um, so I'll use my myself um, as a case study. In the mini course that I done, I, I use examples of athletes from from rugby league, from wrestling, um, and things that I've done in my, my professional career. So again, I should have started with this. Um, this is the best way to start anything. You give like a, a sob story, like an X Factor sob story. Um, if everyone remembers X Factor, uh, everyone used to have a problem before, before singing. So when I left the military, um, I, I suffered really badly from post-traumatic stress and I couldn't really train at a gym. I, I struggled to leave the house actually for a while. Um, and I got really into calisthenics because I could do it in my garden and I got really into mobility. And this is where my passion came from. This would have been a really good opener, wouldn't it? But I've left it till question <laughs> six. I've already lost everyone. They won't even hear this story. Um, and I got really into it. And that's when I was at university and I was studying and I was adding all this science to what was my enthusiasm. And as you can see in the mini course, I can do like John claude Van Damme splits on chairs and stuff, like more mobility than I ever need. Um, really, and so what I would do is I would merge all these all these different m m um, mobility techniques together. And I'm going to give you an example of one session that I did. So my goal was to be as mobile as possible. So if you think calisthenics, the closest thing you can relate it to is gymnastics. Really, um, you need to be able to straddle for a lot of the movements, and the further you can straddle your legs, obviously it makes the biomechanics of holding something with your arms easier. Um, so what I would do, I would sit down and I would merge uh, PRI and RI techniques. And these, uh, they're a lot like proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, where all you're doing is you're trying to trick the body. So a little bit when I talked about mechanoreceptors. And don't worry, I'm not going to go back in and start talking about the physiology again. But I would, for example, say if I'm lengthening my hamstring, I would warm up like you would do for, for any type of physical exercise. But then I would put, I would lay down on the floor and simply do a single leg raise. So I'm bringing my leg up to my trunk and I would use my hands because um, I was already flexible enough. If not, you would obviously use a band or a towel. And I would hold passively for 30 seconds. Again, taking myself on the stress drain cycle to a point where I have some form of uh, stress relaxation. Then what I would do is I would then contract. So it would be an isometric contraction. So I'd be pushing against my own hand. I am trying to push my hand away. So the isometric contraction is, I guess, what would be then my, my hamstring would be pushing away. I would hold that for six seconds. I would relax and I would do it again. A lot of people refer to this as the um, um, stretch, contract, relax method. Um, and I would do that. I would do that for two to three sets. And I would keep continuously push past my bind point for my my hip joint going into um, going to flexion would increase over and over. Then what I would do, so I would get some more active range. Um, I would do R RI, which is um, reciprocal inhibition. It's exactly the same. It's just when you take your leg to the bind. So imagine me lying down, imagine my leg going, well, it wasn't too far away from my head, but in between say my, my trunk and my head. What I would then do is I would contract my quadriceps. So now I've changed what the agonist and antagonist muscle is even I guess that would get confusing because if if you're saying your goal your goal is to um it's a hamstring you would maybe class that as the agonist but it's not because what I'm actually contracting now is the quadriceps so that's I've changed what my agonist muscle is um, I'm using the muscle that would take me into the stretch and I'm strengthening that 
And I would literally do sets of that. And what I would do, I would then go back to doing full movements, whatever movements I wanted to do, the straddle, the squat, for example. And I would try and identify what movement was blocking that range. So if it was rotation, I could repeat that same method, but in rotation. And I would always do some, a lot of full range movements as well. But my actual dedicated mobility part was purely what you would call MET, so uh, post isometric relaxation and uh, reciprocal inhibition, uh, inhibition. And they're easy to find if you want to find more about them. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to explain them in much more detail in, in the podcast, but simple at, at Google search. And again, oh, there'll be plenty of videos out there too for you to watch. Um, and I would, I would, that's what I would use. Nowadays, I don't really do it. I use a lot of eccentric training again because it's probably the easiest way to to use um, or to create a sarcomagenesis and therefore strengthen the muscle while also increasing the distance. Um, not sorry, not the distance, the length. Um, and I just have a lot of research behind it. So in sport, I do use that more. However. I do like to merge things up and it all depends on your mood, if you're in the gym, if you're at home. Um, so again, I, I'm refusing to come to a, um, a singular conclusion. I'm refusing to, to, to give you a, a direct answer. And I'm just saying everything works, find out what's best for you. Make sure that you are taking measurements to see if it's working. It's like the same with strength. You're going to test your bench. You're going to test your squat. It's like the same with power. Maybe you've got an app like my jump and you're testing your power, your velocity output. Same with mobility. Um, and on that mini course, I do go through ways of different ways that you can actually see if you're, if it's improving a, a few easy tests that you can do in a wall, how to use a galvanometer and then, and things like that. Absolutely. Excellent. Super interesting. So John, massive thanks for your time and effort today. It's been a pleasure talking. Where can people find a little bit more about you and what you're up to? Um, well, uh, social media scares me, Matt, so I'm not massively on it. Um, I don't have Twitter, I don't have LinkedIn, which is weird because we constantly tell my students um, that you need to do that nowadays to get out there. Um, what um, I do have is I have a charity page. I run a, a grappling, well, a charity that does kind of grappling events um, and does medical um, support in exchange for money that goes straight to the charity that I volunteer for in York, Choose You for Disabled Children. That does have an Instagram page. So technically, if you do message that, it will go to me. Um, and that's called Northern Grappling Co. And that is pretty much my only social media. I have publications out there. Um, I'll probably link the newest one um, to this just because, you know, free publicity. Um, <laughs> But other than that, I'm, you can email me at my work, at Leeds Beckett. I'm on the site. If you if you type in Lee, uh, John Bell, Leeds Beckett, you'll get my work email and everything. You can find me that way. Perfect. Nice and nice and uh, off the web. That's uh, wise, yeah. mate, wise. How, the healthiest so, way to be. Absolutely. <laughs> so, thank you so much for your time and effort. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to speaking again soon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, mate. I, I, I love talking about anything, really. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> pleasure, mate. Pleasure. And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks to John for all of his hard work on today's podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm sure you do at home too. Before you leave, I want to point you in the direction of the Science Sport Coach Academy. The Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses which are broken down into bite-sized chunks. So if you enjoyed today's podcast and you want to get your hands on some more great sports science information, you can get into the Coach Academy completely for free for the next seven days. And all you have to do is hit the link in the show notes so you can get in there for the foreseeable. Also, when you complete one of those courses, you get a certificate of completion, which will prove your ongoing education. Lastly, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, it'd be fantastic if you could recommend it to a coach, a colleague, an athlete, or a friend. That means that we can keep bringing you the best possible guests and best possible content. And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks from me and Matt Salon of Science of Sport. And I'll speak to you next week.